on the soul and the resurrection translated by william moore and henry austin wilson basil great among the saints had departed from this life to god and the impulse to mourn for him was shared by all the churches but his sister the teacher was still living and so i journeyed to her yearning for an interchange of sympathy over the loss of her brother. My soul was truly sorrow-stricken by this grievous blow, and I sought for one who could feel it equally to mingle my tears with. But when we were in each other's presence, the sight of the teacher awakened all my pain, for she too was lying in a state of prostration, even unto death. Well, she gave in to me for a while, like a skillful driver, in the ungovernable violence of my grief. And then she tried to check me by speaking, and to correct with the curb of her reasonings the disorder of my soul. She quoted the Apostle's words about the duty of not being grieved for them that sleep, because only men without hope have such feelings. With a heart still fermenting with my pain, I asked, How can that ever be practiced by mankind? There is such an instinctive and deep-seated abhorrence of death in everyone. Those who look on a deathbed can hardly bear the sight. And those whom death approaches recoil from him all they can. Why, even the law that controls us puts death highest on the list of crimes, and highest on the list of punishments. By what device, then, can we bring ourselves to regard as nothing a departure from life, even in the case of a stranger, not to mention that of relations, when so be they cease to live? We see before us the whole course of human life aiming at this one thing, how we may continue in this life. Indeed, it is for this that houses have been invented for us to live in, in order that our bodies may not be prostrated in their environment by cold or heat. Agriculture? Again, what is it but the providing of our sustenance? In fact, all thought about how we are to go on living is occasioned by the fear of dying. Why is medicine so honored among men? Because it is thought to carry on the combat with death, to a certain extent, by its methods. Why do we have corslets and long shields and greaves and helmets and all the defensive armor, and enclosures of fortifications and iron-barred gates, except that we fear to die? Death, then, being naturally so terrible to us, how can it be easy for a survivor to obey this command, to remain unmoved by friends departed? Why, what is the special pain you feel, asked the teacher, in the mere necessity itself of dying? This common talk of unthinking persons is no sufficient accusation. What? Is there no occasion for grieving? I replied to her. When we see one who so lately lived and spoke, becoming all of a sudden lifeless and motionless, with the sense of every bodily organ extinct, with no sight or hearing in operation, or any other faculty of apprehension that sense possesses. And if you apply fire or steel to him, even if you were to plunge a sword into the body, or cast it to the beasts of prey, or bury it underneath a mound, that dead man is alike unmoved at any treatment. Seeing, then, that this change is observed in all these ways, and that principle of life, whatever it might be, disappears all at once out of sight, as the flame of an extinguished lamp which burnt on it the moment before neither remains upon the wick nor passes to any other place, but completely disappears, can such a change be borne without emotion by one who has no clear ground to rest upon? 
We hear the departure of the spirit. We see the shell that is left. But of the part that has been separated, we are ignorant, both as to its nature and as to the place where it has fled. For neither earth nor air nor water nor any other element can show as residing within itself this force that has left the body at whose withdrawal a, only a corpse remains, ready for dissolution. While I was thus enlarging upon the subject, the teacher signed to me with her hand and said, Surely, what alarms and disturbs your mind is not the thought that the soul, instead of lasting forever, ceases with the body's dissolution. I answered rather audaciously, and without due consideration of what I said, for my passionate grief had not yet given me back my judgment. In fact, I said that the divine utterances seemed to me like mere commands compelling us to believe that the soul lasts forever. Not, however, that we were led by them to this belief by any reasoning. Our mind within us appears slavishly to accept the opinion enforced, but not to acquiesce with a spontaneous impulse. Hence, our sorrow over the departed is all the more grievous. We do not exactly know whether this vivifying principle is anything by itself, where it is, how it is, whether in fact it exists in any way at all, anywhere. This uncertainty about the real state of the case balances the opinions on either side. Many adopt the one view, many the other. And indeed, there are certain persons of no small philosophical reputation among the Greeks who have held and maintained this which I have just said. Away, she cried, with that pagan nonsense. For therein the inventor of lies fabricates only false theories to harm the truth. Observe this and nothing else, that such a view about the soul amounts to nothing less than the abandonment of virtue, and seeking the pleasure of the moment only. The life of eternity, by which alone virtue claims the advantage, must be despaired of. And pray how, I asked, are we to get a firm and unmovable belief in the soul's continuance? I, too, am sensible of the fact that human life will be bereft of the most beautiful ornament which life has to give, I mean virtue, unless an undoubting confidence with regard to this be established within us. What, indeed, does virtue have to stand upon in the case of those persons who conceive of this present life as the limit of their existence, and who hope for nothing beyond. Well, replied the teacher, we must seek where we may get a beginning for our discussion upon this point. And if you please, let the defense of the opposing views be undertaken by yourself. For I see that your mind is a little inclined to accept such a brief. Then, after the conflicting belief has been stated, we shall be able to look for the truth. When she made this request, and I had deprecated the suspicion that I was making the objections in real earnest, instead of only wishing to get a firm ground for the belief about the soul, by calling into court first what is aimed against this view, I began. End of Part 1 of On the Soul and the Resurrection